Hello, this is Dr. Funda Goldman, and today I was going to talk to you about using natural oils for skin and body care. So it's going to be an integrative um, perspective from both the naturopathic and Ayurvedic paradigms. And also, I just wanted to mention, I really appreciate um, all the people who've been subscribing and spending time watching videos and, you know, giving likes and giving very kind comments. Um, it's very helpful to me. Uh, for many years, I used to talk in front of live audiences, and so it's a little bit different doing it online, but it's nice to get that feedback, and I appreciate the support, so thank you on all counts. So here we go. Um, again, note of caution, um, always with my uh, discussions, um, the information presented here is for educational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice. For any symptoms that are severe or worsening, please contact a qualified healthcare professional. And it's always important to determine the root cause of any disease and to develop a comprehensive treatment plan. And again, we're talking about natural oils today, which can be part of a treatment plan, but um, on its own, it's usually not sufficient. So um, again, uh, keep that in mind as we go ahead. So why use natural oils? Um, well, first of all, this talk is only, I'm only going to be discussing base oils. I'm not going to be discussing essential oils, which is probably a few other videos. Um, but just as base oils, why is that, you know, good or important? Well, obviously, because you're putting natural oils on the skin, it really supports skin health, which is the largest organ in the body. And so you can uh, directly affect um, uh, inflammation and dryness of the skin, for example. Um, it's also potentially detoxifying for the body, depending on how you're using the oil. Um, and especially if you're using other techniques, such as massage, it can be very helpful with lymphatic drainage, so it can help decrease swelling and edema in the body. It also, by again using natural oils with different techniques, um, improves circulation. And by improving blood flow to tissues of the body, you're basically increasing the nutrition available to those tissues, and you're also sweeping away and, and kind of flushing out toxins from um, that have been um, made by those tissues. Also, especially using natural oils um, with different techniques can improve tissue tone, so this can increase, uh, increase muscle quality, and do things like decrease things like wrinkles, which people, quite a few people are concerned about, and also things like cellulite. Um, and also because of this improved circulation and drainage, it can really help with wound healing. And again, using natural oils in combination with different techniques is can usually be very relaxing for the nervous system. And so again, the na using natural oils can be additive or included in different body care techniques such as massage, marma therapy, otherwise known as Ayurvedic acupressure, um, different sorts of cleansing programs, Panchakarma, which is an Ayurvedic type of cleanse, Shirodhara, which is basically um, dripping warm oil on the third eye, which is used for different things. Um, so again, what I'm going to be talking about today has a large component of Ayurveda. Um, or traditional Indian medicine, um, because part of what Ayurveda includes as part of that medical paradigm is energetic effects um, of foods and activities and, and just different sorts of products such as oils. So we're going to be talking about vata, pitta, and kapha, or wind, fire, and earth. I'll get into that more on the next slide. And also Ayurveda and naturopathic, both, both paradigms, really um, emphasize and um, revere using natural products because they both believe that there's a natural vitality, there's a natural sort of essence or chi or prana, you know, whichever paradigm you're talking from, um, that they have natural vitality and potentially even wisdom <clears throat> that can be helpful in um, helping disease. So uh, consider that as well. And also using natural oils, um, especially if you're doing any of these sort of um, self-care techniques, is really about taking care of yourself on many levels. Uh, the body, obviously, but also the mind and achieving balance in your life generally. So if you're interested in topics like this, you might also look at um, my different playlists, specifically the body care playlist. Um, we'll talk about different kinds of body care techniques and also the marmotherapy playlist. 
um, because typically, very often, monotherapy includes the use of oils, uh, which again, we're talking about today. So, of course, there are contraindications for using oils. Obviously, the first one is any sort of allergy to a specific oil. If there are any sort of open wounds, it's not a good idea to use oils. Any sort of recent injury or surgery, not the best idea until you've gotten clearance from your doctor to use oils. Um, different sorts of infectious disease involving the skin. So things like varicella infection, which causes chicken pox in children and also shingles um, in older adults. Not a good idea to use oils um, because of the type of condition, you know, the sort of blistering it causes on the skin. There are some types of contact dermatitis that are not helped. They're actually worsened by using oils because a lot of contact dermatitis, it's better to keep this, the skin cool and dry um, rather than lubricated with oil. And if you're interested specifically in how to treat poison ivy, for example, naturally, I made a whole video on that. And that gets into not just sort of topical um, products, which is most often what's discussed um, but it actually gives you different sorts of internal therapies as well, such as homeopathy and nutrition. So it's, it's really the whole kit and caboodle with treating poison ivy naturally. So if that's of interest, that's another video. Some pitta states, um, again, I'm going to get into pitta more, but pitta is basically a kind of fire. And uh, pitta states and skin often involve, almost always involve inflammation. So with some sorts of pitta states, because it's fiery and there's a sort of oily and spreading quality of pitta, um, you don't want to use warm oil to spread things more. So with some sorts of pitta states, you wouldn't want to use heated oil. You only use unheated oil, if at all. Um, you tend to use less oil when the weather is warm because warm oil on hot days can actually increase pitta. Um, and so as an alternative, you might consider cool water to balance pitta states if oil isn't a good idea. Um, also some excessive, excessive use of oils with kapha states. Kapha is naturally oily and wet. And so using, and it's also heavy. So using, uh, hydrating heavy oils, um, can actually make some kapha states worse. So typically... What you want to do is warm up the oil if you use much um, to counterbalance some of that wet heaviness of the that's naturally characteristic of the oil. And you don't want to use oils as much on cold, cloudy, wet weather days because the weather the weather is basically kapha. <laughs> so you know kapha is naturally going to increase during kapha weather. And so as an alternative, you might consider dry brushing to get some of the similar effects to using oils when there's a high degree of kapha. So consider that. And then some, there's actually some combinations, some illnesses which are a combination of pitta and kapha, such as cystic acne, um, which again, because it's hot and oily and kind of static, um, oils can be contraindicated in that sort of condition. So if you're interested in treating acne naturally, I actually created another video on that, um, the title of which is, What is a Naturopathic Physician Anyway and How Do We Treat Acne? And that gets into, again, you know, diet and internal things you can do. Um, it's really the whole kit and caboodle. The second part of that video is about how to treat acne. Um, also, when you use oils, um, they can often stain fabrics, so be cautious of that, you know, don't go and oil your body and then go wear your nicest clothes or sit on your nicest uh, couch. <laughs> you probably want to wear some old um, fabrics um, right after oiling your body. And the other thing to consider is that the amount of oil that's used, so the technique that you use and even how you use your hands, how rapidly you move your hands or what direction you move your hands, um, and um, again, the timing and frequency um, can be important. So for example, somebody who's in a high kapha state or who has a kapha composition, constitution, excuse me, they really shouldn't be using oiling techniques too much, maybe once a week, maybe once every other week. Whereas somebody who's in a vata state or in a 
windy state, they they do really well with oil techniques, so they can do it almost every day. Um, so again, that's those are probably other talks, <laughs> but I just wanted to mention that um, depending again on your constitution and the kind of condition you're looking to treat, um, technique, timing, and frequency are also components of um, uh, effective therapy. Uh, I also wanted to mention specifically oiling the scalp and the hair because um, this can be a mixed bag, um, especially if somebody has fine hair or alopecia. Oiling the scalp and the hair may be too aggressive in the therapy and it could make things worse. Um, it's difficult to wash out, especially if you have fine hair or you know just patches of hair, um, especially with thicker oils, it can pull hair out. So, and it can pull hair out, not just on your head, but also eyebrows and eyelashes. So again, um, consider that um, because again, the hair follicles may be weak. Um, typically that's due to high vata and high pitta conditions. But um, again, if you're too aggressive, it can pull hair out, um, which can be um, counterproductive. Um, so what you might try instead is because actually oiling the scalp and hair can be helpful for fine hair and alopecia. I've actually used it to help people um, with alopecia. One woman specifically, um, she was a very pitta or fiery personality type, was very active, was bicycling at least an hour every day, and she worked in a factory. And in the summers, she worked in this building that was over 100 degrees every day. Um, and then she ended up getting uh, COVID. And so because of the infection, a lot of times, again, when there's an infection, people's hair can fall out. So all these factors contributed to alopecia for her, but she had really thin, fine hair and she had, you know, a few patches from the alopecia. So I didn't want to do anything aggressive. So with her, what I did was I took some yogurt. I took about half a cup of whole fat yogurt, or I told her to do this. A half a cup of whole fat yogurt and just put one tablespoon of sunflower olive or coconut oil these are cooling oils and again we'll get to more of that on, on next slides um, and to make a little yogurt oil pack and to put that on her head and let that soak on her head for about 20 30 minutes and then rinse it out um, and that you can I would only do once a week at most or once every two weeks as a supportive therapy this by itself will not bring hair back but it'll help cool the scalp down um, and it really helped her a lot um, so anyway again be very careful about oiling the scalp and the hair sometimes I see like in uh, movies especially like uh, Hindi movies and stuff sometimes you know you see somebody oiling somebody's scalp because it's a very deep thing in the culture and they're being very aggressive with their hair and their scalp. And I was like, wow, that person must have a really strong scalp because some people with that really aggressive uh, movement, um, hair would come out and the person wouldn't be happy. So again, consider that um, if you're thinking about oiling your body. The other thing to consider when using oils is that you always want to use clean and pure oils. Um, you know, consider a lot of people don't really think about that, but oils can be absorbed into the skin and go into the bloodstream and anything in the oil can be absorbed into the skin, go into the bloodstream stream. So that's why things like medicated patches like nicotine and lidocaine medicated patches work is because the medicine goes through the skin and into the bloodstream. And there's actually a fairly large study about some toxic properties of sunscreen, which is supposed to help your skin, but because of so many chemicals um, used in sunscreens these days, you have to be very careful. Um, so anyway, it's just another point. And also you really want to think about using clean, everybody should think about using clean, pure oils, but especially if you're pregnant or nursing, anything that goes in your bloodstream can um, get into your child potentially. So be careful about that. And then, um, and when I mean clean, pure oils, what I mean is, you know, it's best to choose organic oils to avoid pesticides and additional hormones. And it's best to use oils that are cold pressed so that you avoid any sort of chemicals or side reactions that are produced or through the process of um, 
uh, squeezing the oil out of plants. Um, and you might even think about getting a food grade um, oil, for example, coconut oil. Um, at least in the States, it's usually, food grade is usually purer than cosmetic grade, and it's usually cheaper, which is nice. But you might think about, like, is this oil pure enough for me to eat it? And again, that won't work for every oil, and it also doesn't work for everybody because a lot of people eat a lot of processed food that has a lot of chemicals, and they're really not thinking about chemicals generally. Um, but I just wanted to bring home this point that it's really best to use the cleanest, purest oils you can find. So a few words about Ayurveda. If you're not familiar with this paradigm of medicine, another name for it is traditional Indian medicine. It's over 5,000 years old. And one of the things I really appreciate about this paradigm of medicine is that it includes energies of things. So energies of people, the energies of disease, energies of therapeutics, um, and if you're interested in this type of um, content, um, you know, on Ayurveda, I have a whole uh, video playlist, so you can kind of look at that if that's of interest. But the most important thing when we're talking about skin is the concept of vata, pitta, and kapha. So vata, or you can also think of it as wind. When you think of the wind, the qualities of wind are cold, dry, clear, light and moving right when it starts spinning around and blowing trees and, and that sort of thing that's vata so pitta or fire the nature qualities of pitta or fire is that it's hot it's wet it's oily and spreading so anytime somebody is in a pitta state or has a pitta constitution they're likely to develop you know um like inflammatory conditions that tend to spread um, kapha is the next one, or earth, and the nature of qualities of kapha, cold, wet, heavy, static. So you think about earth, you think about mud. So people can have a constitution where they're naturally more windy, or vata. Um, they're usually, you know, scattered all over the place. They can have ADHD, that sort of thing. There are people who are very pitta or fiery by constitution. They tend to be very direct and focused and organized and ambitious. And people who are kapha or earthy, they tend to be more stable and kind of caretakers, that sort of thing. But also diseases and skin types can fall into these categories as well. So the idea is that depending on whether you're vata, pitta, or kapha, um, the way to balance these energies is to introduce the opposite energies. So for example, if, you're, if you have a vata condition, which is cold and dry and light, you would be best to introduce therapies that are warm and moist and heavy or grounding. Okay, so just as a beginning concept here. So if we take this Ayurvedic perspective and apply it to oils, so what I've done here is created this diagram and on one axis from left to right, we have warm to cool. So again, we're talking energetics. So we're not talking about temperature so much, like heating something over a stove. We're talking about the natural properties of the oils um, from which they're originally derived. So some oils are naturally heating or warming by nature, and some oils are naturally cooling by nature. So that's one axis. And then on the other axis, we have oils that are lighter, such as sunflower oil, versus something that's heavier, like coconut oil. I mean, it's opaque, right? It's not even liquid at room temperature unless you're in a really hot room. So those are really the two axes um, by which to think about oils and then choose the best ones. So for somebody who's in a vata or windy state, again, vata has the qualities of cool, light, and dry. So what you want to do is introduce oils that are warming, moist, and grounding. And most oils are moist, again, uh, because that's the nature of most oils. And they tend to be grounding because they're heavier than like a dry leaf. Um, but some oils are cooling and some oils are warming. So um, you can see in this diagram, the blue circle here that sits in the corner of oils that are warm and heavy. So those are going to be best for vata. But you can see that vata, the sort of blue circle, has the greatest surface area in this diagram because most oils are going to work for vata because vata is so dry, 
almost any oil except, except something really extreme like mustard oil, which I don't recommend because it can be so heating, it can actually blister your skin if you have sensitive skin, so I don't recommend mustard oil. Um, but anyway, um, warm, heavy oils are going to be best, but Vata has the greatest uh, range of oils that are helpful to that constitution type or disease situation. So for pitta or fire, again, the nature of pitta is that it's hot and wet and spreading. And so you can see here what pitta needs is it needs mostly to cool down because, again, fire is fire. It needs to cool down. Otherwise, it gets out of control and burns everything down. So, And also pitta is pretty intense, so you want gentle therapies. Um, so you can see in this diagram, Pitta mostly sits on the extreme side of coolness. Like that's the most important thing when choosing an oil for Pitta conditions or Pitta people. You want to use cooling oils to keep them cooled down. Um, and then if we look at copper earth, so again, the qualities, natural qualities of copper earth are cold, heavy, static. So what kapha needs to balance it is it needs warmth and lightness to get it moving and flowing instead of just kind of sitting there. Okay, so um, you can see for kapha, uh, the gray circle here, it has the smallest surface area because most oils are going to be wet and heavy um, and kapha doesn't do, because it's already wet and heavy, um, kapha doesn't do well with a lot of oils or really heavy oils or really cold oils. So you can see that m the best oils for kapha are going to be light and warm. They're going to sit in that quadrant. And again, kapha people and kapha situations um, should only use a bit of oil and infrequently, as opposed to vata, who can use usually oil therapies almost every day. So again, and then you can also see in the middle here, <laughs> right in the middle, this purple circle is neutral oils. So there are some oils that really kind of sit in the middle here, which can be used for almost any constitution type or situation. So I'll get into that with specific oils. But again, I just wanted to kind of diagram out here, you know, light versus heavy and cool versus warming, because that's really, those are the thoughts that go through my head at least when I'm choosing an oil to suggest for somebody to use. Okay, so now let's talk about the Ayurvedic perspective on skin. So again, we can take this idea of vata, pitta, and kapha, or wind, fire, and earth, and apply it to skin types and skin conditions. Because so skin, when I say skin type, I mean sort of the constitutional, you know, baseline um, situation for people. And then when I talk about skin situations, we're talking about acute illnesses, for example. So for people who are mostly vata or windy types, their skin is going to be cool, light, dry, and moving. So what does that mean? They're going to have dry skin, it's going to be cold, usually there's a little grayish tinge, and it tends to be kind of wrinkled because it's so dry, and there can be irregularities with the skin because, again, the wind is moving to and fro, the wind is not constant. Right, and so specific conditions that are considered vata, vata type conditions, skin conditions, are dryness, things like eczema and psoriasis that include a lot of dryness and wrinkles. Okay? So if we look at pitta or fiery type skin conditions and types, again, pitta, the nature of fire is that it's hot and it's spreading, um, it's wet and it's oily. So when people have a pitta constitution and pitta type skin as a baseline, it tends to be kind of reddish or yellowish in color or a tinge to it. They can be quite sweaty. There can be kind of this sour smelling um, aspect to them. Um, their skin tends to be hot, it tends to be inflamed, and it tends to be oily. So specific conditions that are pitta in nature, rashes, hives, insect bites, so all that kind of hot red stuff that you see on skin. Most acne has some component of pitta. And also things like moles or vitiligo. So moles and vitiligo, you're basically looking at changes in the melanocytes, uh, melanin and melanocytes. And so those are either um, spreading in nature, typically. <laughs> I mean, moles and vitiligo, they spread, but also there's kind of spread on a cellular level and destruction on a cellular level because there's too much heat in the body. 
So kapha and earth, the natural uh, components of this are it's cold, wet, heavy, static. So people with kapha type skin generally, their skin tends to be cold and smooth, pale, maybe whitish, and tends to be oily. Um, and kapha conditions of the skin include things like cysts and whiteheads, right? So things are building up and they're not moving because <laughs> um, the circulation probably isn't moving very well. And then things like edema and swelling are kapha type conditions. So um, this should help, this slide should help you uh, figure out what type of skin type you might have and skin condition you might be dealing with. You can be a mixed type. The other thing is that even though we're talking about you know applying oil to the skin and we're only doing topical applications today, a lot of people tend to focus on external applications um, to help the skin, but a lot of times really what's needed to help the skin, usually the skin is just the window for inner conditions. Um, and so a lot of times to help the skin, you really need to do internal work, which I'm not going to go into here. Um, but if you're interested in things like that, you might look at the videos I've made for um, foods, food lists, um, and diet for bata, pitta, and kapha constitution types and conditions. Um, yeah, so again, oiling the body is just one therapy, but again, a comprehensive treatment plan, that's what we're aiming for, right? Okay, so there are many, again, any condition, so I just talked about skin, um, any kind of condition can be sort of looked at from this sort of vata, pitta, kapha lens or wind, fire, earth lens from the Ayurvedic paradigm. And I obviously can't get into all of it because it would just, it would just go on for years really. But we can also look at arthritis as one example of kind of a slightly deeper aspect because again, massage can be very helpful for arthritis. A lot of people use massage. So choosing an oil that's appropriate for the type of arthritis that you have can be, you know, an additional benefit. So you actually have vata or windy type arthritis, pitta or fiery type of arthritis, and kapha or earthy type of arthritis. So again, the qualities of vata are cool, light, dry, moving. So you can imagine cool, light, dry, moving joints <laughs> That you're gonna have, these are gonna be joints that are cold, they're gonna be dry, they're gonna be cracking, popping, there's gonna be degeneration, and the pain shifts just like the wind shifts, right? It's not like a constant pain. And people with Vata type of arthritis, they tend to do worse with movement because they're moving too much generally, and more movement makes them more windy. Also, cold because wind is cold, and fall weather um, can make uh, arthritis, Vata types of arthritis worse. And then there's pitta or fiery type of arthritis, again, hot, wet, spreading. This type of arthritis tends to be hot, throbbing, reddish, um, can be swollen. And this tends to be worse from excess movement because, again, pitta tends to be an intense type. And so they tend to do things to excess, you know, high intensity. So too much of anything kind of throws them out of balance more. Humid weather, because it's hot and wet, makes them more uh, pitta-like and more fiery. It can make things worse. Summer weather, because it's typically hot, if not hot and wet, can make them worse. And heat. So heat can make things worse. Sometimes people apply heat to arthritis to stimulate circulation, but sometimes people apply so much heat <laughs> that they actually do it to go numb. And so um, that's, uh, you know, I just wanted to remark on that is that sometimes people say, well, heat makes my, you know, arthritis better, but, you know, dry, a little bit of dry heat would maybe help, you know, if there's some stiffness with pitta arthritis, but excessive amounts of heat, you know, especially to the point of numbness is going to make pitta types of arthritis worse. So consider that. And then we have kapha earthy types of arthritis. So again, earth, cold, wet, heavy, static. So Kapha types of arthritis are going to be cold and swollen and dull or constant pain. Yeah, not moving, not changing. And then kapha types of arthritis is going to be worse with cold weather. Um, it can get worse with humid weather because of the wetness, not because of the heat. Um, it can also get worse with pressure. So like when the weather changes and people say they can feel it in their joints, that's usually because there's some kapha there. 
um, from sitting still too long. So if they're not moving enough, because again, kapha types of conditions and constitutions is very solid. And so they actually need to get moving more to increase circulation, to decrease the pain. And then spring. Spring is usually the worst time for kapha because it's warming up. Um, you know, it's, it's still cold, but starting to warm up. Um, and the other thing is that um, it's usually wet. And so that tends to make kapha types of conditions, especially kapha type of arthritis worse. So again, just taking one type of condition and showing you how you can apply vata, pitta, and kapha, those concepts to a condition to again, choose the best oils. Again, going back to, to again, choose the best oils um, to help your situation. So let's take a few oils here. And again, we have two spectrums. So we have coldest to warmest, and then we have lighter to heavier. Although you can see it, it from top down, coldest is gonna be coconut oil, warmest is gonna be sesame oil, but then I had to shift the lighter, heavier a little bit. So the lightest oil in this list is gonna be sunflower oil. And then if the farther away you move away from sunflower oil, the heavier you get. So coconut oil is cold and heavy. And so it's gonna be best to balance vata and pitta. Um, coconut oil traditionally is used for sort of emergency cooling situations in Ayurveda. So things like hives and bug bites, um, something like that. You can put a little bit of coconut oil and it tends to help, you know, pretty um, quickly to decrease inflammation. Um, olive oil is cold and heavy. It's not as cold and not as heavy as coconut oil, so, but it's also best for vata and pitta. So again, this is a spectrum here. In the middle here, neutral for vata, pitta, and kapha is sunflower oil. It's slightly cooling, but not really cold. Um, it's on the lighter side. Um, and so it's really good for all con constitutions and types of conditions, if you're gonna use an oil, if in oil is indicated. Um, so when in doubt, sunflower oil is the best. So if, if all this is confusing, if you're not into Ayurveda or Vata Pitta Kapha, sunflower oil is usually the you know, most neutral and so you still get therapeutic effects without you know, uh, being too concerned about much else. So if we keep moving down here though, corn oil is next. So it's a lighter oil, it's warming and it's drying. So because it's warming, it's not great for pitta or fire conditions, and it's also drying, so it's not the greatest for uh, vata conditions because vata is already dry. So, you know, if you've ever, like, eaten a corn tortilla or made cornbread or something out of corn, you know, usually those, the, like, the tortilla dries out, corn tortilla dries out right away or cornbread dries out right away unless you add a lot of other stuff to it, like oil, um, because corn is naturally warm and dry. So this oil though is, is the best, one of the best for kapha because kapha is cold and wet. So warm and dry and light works for kapha. So again, even though it's good for kapha, you still only want to use small amounts and infrequent amounts for kapha generally because of the nature of kapha. And then if we keep moving down here, the warmest and the heaviest oil on this list is sesame oil. Um, and because it's warm and heavy, um, it's best for vata and kapha. It's usually way too intense and too hot for pitta conditions, so it can make pitta conditions like acne, for example, worse. So there you go. So that's how you use the, these ideas of vata, pitta, kapha, and cold and warm and light and heavy to choose oils. And then a few other oils. And again, the oils I'm including in the discussion today are oils that I use most frequently in my practice. Um, so they cover, they can be helpful for almost any condition. Um, so a few other oils. Um, and again, these are for topical use only, um, even though sometimes people like, especially castor oil, Sometimes people try to ingest that for different reasons, but I never suggest people ingest castor oil because it can cause GI upset and uterine contractions. So if you're pregnant, definitely not a good idea. Um, so, but what's nice about these three oils, castor oil, jojoba oil, and rosehip seed oil, is that they're all neutral. So they can be used for vata, pitta, and kapha conditions. 
Okay. So castor oil. Um, I never use castor oil straight on somebody's body unless it's for a castor oil pack because it's very thick. Um, it's hard to move over the skin by itself and because it's thick it can pull out hair so uh, be very careful there even though small amounts of castor oil can be helpful with bringing hair growth back by itself unless you have really strong hair um, and are, you know really strong follicles I don't suggest people use castor oil straight so you can mix 25% castor oil with 75% sunflower oil that's a pretty good mixture. That's easy to use. It moves, you know, pretty easily over the skin. Um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really, um, you still have to be careful though. If you have very fine or very, um, fragile hair, even this might be too much, but, um, usually this is not a problem if you're careful. Um, castor oil is anti-inflammatory. It's also detoxifying. So, um, that can do a lot of good things. Um, it can also help with revision of scars. Um, once you get the okay uh, by your doctor to use them, um, use it. Um, it can help with hair growth, but again, you have to be careful. See the previous slide. I went over that on a previous slide, so make sure you look at that. Um, and don't overuse castor oil or use it in the wrong context. And again, this mixture of 25% castor oil with 75% sunflower oil, it's actually a really good makeup remover. So if you're looking for a natural makeup remover, that works pretty well. Um, and it's actually the most moisturizing, I find, um, of this whole list, um, even more so than coconut oil. Well, coconut oil and sesame oil are pretty moisturizing, but castor oil has a little bit, it kind of sticks around a little bit longer. Um, so, um, you know, again, because the weather affects our skin, you can change different oils. So castor oil may be too kind of heavy too much for summertime uh, because we're sweating you know I like people to sweat sometimes I don't use that much oil I tend not to use that much oil in the summer because I think people should be sweating and getting rid of toxins from their body that way and I don't want any sort of oil to prevent that process um, but you know when it gets cold and dry in the winter cast its castor oil mix can do wonders with helping with dry skin um, and even if you don't have really dry skin, but like usually the area around the eyes and the lips can get drier, you can just use castor oil, you know, um, this mix of castor oil um, as your sort of like, instead of like an eye cream, <laughs> that sort of thing, because it's really good for moisturizing those areas that are a little bit drier, even on the face, right? Because there aren't as many sebaceous glands and the skin is thinner around the eyes, for example. Um, jojoba oil is the next one. This oil is great because it's the closest um, consistency to natural skin sebum. So it's a really great balancer for skin that's too oily, too dry, you know, very sensitive skin um, that doesn't respond well or kind of over responds to, um, you know, commercial cosmetics and stuff like that. So because it's closest to natural skin sebum, um, it, it's really great for correcting texture and moisture levels of skin. It's also anti-inflammatory. So I have patients who have rosacea, for example, or eczema, psoriasis, and jojoba oil is really helpful to them. They loved it. Um, and then the last oil here is rosehip seed oil. Rosehip seed oil contains vitamins A, C, and E, so a lot of antioxidants. So um, it's very helpful for things like acne and acne scars, discoloration of the skin and wrinkles. So it's, it's very much a sort of corrective oil. Um, also, uh, some dermatologists recommend rosehip seed oil in place of or as an alternative to Retin-A if your skin is too irritated by Retin-A or if you're pregnant or nursing, um, and that's contra taking retin-A and retinols um, is contraindicated during that time. So you might switch over to rosehip seed oil as an alternative. What's also nice about rosehip seed oil is that it's a dry oil. And so if you put it on your skin and you just wait a few minutes, it'll actually absorb into your skin. And so it won't make your skin look greasy. Some of these oils, if you put too much on them, you know, you have this kind of high shine on your face that you may not want. And so, again, the rosehip seed oil is very nice because it just really absorbs into the skin. 
So there you have it, a uh, whole long discussion on natural oils, why it's beneficial, um, and how to use them, especially from an Ayurvedic perspective. Um, but yeah, especially using oils in the right context can be really helpful um, with a lot of skin conditions and other conditions as well. So I hope you found this talk helpful. I appreciate your time. Thank you for being here. And until the next one, take care.